Howdy. <laughs> It was, it was great. I might uh, try to take some of that. That was absolutely wonderful. So thank you. Uh, the questions that brought me here began with a painting. Uh, I was at the Hunter Museum uh, of American Art in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and came across a remarkable portrait by James Cameron of Colonel James Whiteside, uh, his wife Harriet and slaves from about 1859. They crossed from each other at a marble table, the couple locks eyes, dressed in their finest clothing. They sit on, a, on, a, on an extravagant veranda of gray and white tiles, enclosed by a stone banister which angles down to a staircase on either side. At left, a young slave ascends the steps. A nurse, a light-skinned slave, sits on the tile floor at right. She holds the infant son of the couple. Behind, the banister and columns open to a panoramic landscape on Lookout Mountain that sweeps into the distance. A local rock formation stands precariously in the space between Harriet and James. They're framed even farther back by the broad oxbow of the Tennessee River. And to the right, the growing city of Chattanooga, Tennessee, where, White, where Whiteside served as, as mayor, and as a prominent industrialist and developer. The bustling town with its new buildings and a church spire dot the landscape. Most spectacularly, a train rolls into the local depot, a tuft of smoke pouring forth from its engine. The sources of Colonel Whiteside's prosperity frame his body visually. To the left, the tourist infrastructure Whiteside developed to attract wealthy visitors to his Lookout Mountain Hotel. And to the right, Chattanooga. Through his investment in traditionally northern industries, an iron foundry and railroad, Whiteside became a wealthy man in a city, a flourishing one. In this respect, more than a southern planner, Whiteside resembled the boosters and urbanists of the industrial north. Such men viewed their cities in direct competition with peers to attract scarce labor and capital. Looking at this painting and others like it, I, I began to wonder about the nature of artistic communities in 19th century America. How exceptional were patrons like Whiteside or artists like James Cameron in Chattanooga or, or even in the South as a whole? Who were their peers and how can we critically examine their growth as paintings like this challenge us to do? Questions like this are the stock and trade of art historians. But I wondered how we could use new tools and databases to open up these traditional problems, employing new methods to complement or highlight discrepancies in the existing literature. Towards this goal, I'll, I'll address my methods first before returning back to Chattanooga. Begun in 1970 and opened to the public in 1976 as, as part of the nation's bicentennial celebrations, the inventory of American paintings serves as a guide to over 300,000 American paintings. It's valuable as the most comprehensive database of American works available, well-maintained and with clean metadata. Uh, now, I'll quote here from the cataloging manual uh, to make its specifications clear. And uh, if you ever want to read something fun, this is 209 pages of, of cataloging details. Uh, <laughs> the inventory references paintings by American artists in public and private collections throughout the United States, as well as in foreign countries, which is to say it's, you know, it's things in museums in the United States, it's things in private collections, it's even in private collections in, in Europe or, or Asia. Uh, included our works in oil, watercolor, pastel, tempera, gouache, and fresco. Excluded our works done in pen, ink, and crayon unless used in combination with a paint media such as ink or watercolor. As a national census, the inventory is non-discriminatory. No judgments are made about the relative merits of an artwork or the reputation of its maker. What is, what is of negligible interest to the art critic may be, a vital, may be a vital concern to the historian. Now, the database calls information from museums, historical societies, auctions, dealers, as well as vetted surveys of private collections. So sometimes you'll be looking through and you'll see something from you know, the National Society of, of you know, Southern Dames. Um, uh, lost, in work, lost and destroyed works are even included, such as those by Charles Bird King incinerated in the Smithsonian Fire of 1865. And thanks to the program staff, each of these entries comes accompanied by significant metadata. For, for its catalogers, uh, there, there's that manual, uh, which delineates every possible field. The Whiteside portrait, for example, uh, comes in the inventory with 16 fields of data, ranging from tombstone information, the artist, the date, the owner, dimensions, 
uh, to a list of the painting subjects. Uh, as a result, the figures and landscapes within the painting are all catalogued. The entry lets us know that the work is a portrait of a family, of Whiteside, his wife Harriet, his son Charles, of a mayor, an industrialist, a businessman, of an African American, a slave, and so forth. All, all of that data is, is included in this, in this database. Uh, and all of them are tagged separately. Thus, uh, if necessary, we could very quickly put a finger on, say, the 2,000 portraits of George Washington. Or given the true purpose of the internet, uh, we could find 947 cat pictures. <laughs> Each feline comes with extensive and reliable metadata. But what if we turn from cats to places such as Tennessee, uh, where about 95 works depict the state uh, that, are, that are known in the, in the database? Uh, looking deeper at these entries, we get a sense of their range. An oil painting in the Metropolitan Museum's collection, a watercolor of Lookout Mountain from about 1870 by someone named F.H. Taylor, uh, sold through a dealer and now in an unknown private collection. Uh, there is, as well, the portrait of Colonel Whiteside. As a result, we're using the F.H. Ta Taylors of this world, works we can't see, to assist in, re in our research. Irvin Panofsky drew the distinction between documents and monuments. He gives the example of a 15th century triptych and the contract commissioning it. For Panofsky, an art historian, the triptych was the object of his research, his monument. The contract, however, was an instrument for interpretation his document to shed light on the monumental triptych. Panofsky, of course, maintained that for other scholars, say, a historian of law, the contract might become a monument and the triptych a document. In effect, uh, this project amplifies the number of documents to the 300,000 plus paintings in the inventory of American paintings. Uh, knowing the 97 works that depict Tennessee is not necessarily valuable. Instead, it might be more useful to break that data into chunks and then look at it accordingly. So on this end, I've taken all the works uh, depicting Tennessee. Uh, these have been bro broken up into chunks so that each five-year interval reflects the total number of artists who painted Tennessee in the preceding decade. If James Cameron, for example, had painted Chattanooga 10 times, he's counted once as an active painter. If a work has a, an approximate date, then I include all possible dates within this range, placing extra padding of, of a year on each end. Paintings without known or estimated dates are discounted. By including all works in the previous decade, uh, the, goal, the goal has been to be inclusive, even generous. Indeed, such data seems to approximate the size of an artistic community or, or consciousness in a given place. I can, say, I can say this given the comprehensiveness of the inventory, as well as because of the way American artists tended to employ landscapes as a trope in their work. By painting the places they lived in and traveled to, artists created records that reflect their interest in a location, access to materials or capital, uh, as well as the local infrastructure. Now, viewing Cameron's white side portrait cr chronologically, certain details of its context become clear. I've placed a, a red line around the year of Cameron's portrait. We see that significantly few artists depicted Tennessee up until the mid-1850s. Uh, an influx of painters greeted the, greeted the state at this point, among whom Cameron stood. He was a, a Scottish-born immigrant who trained in Philadelphia and then moved to Tennessee. Uh, now, the graph here isn't the end of my research. By making trends visible and schematic, it's actually more of an invitation, an opening to further research. It allows quickly to see the development and reach of an artistic community over time, challenging us to dig deeper. All the information here was previously available. The key, the key is to organize it into meaningful schematic patterns, driving and then driven by pointed questions. We can ask, for example, was Cameron's experience in Chattanooga representative of Southern painters as a whole? Here I've taken data for the 11 Confederate states, which, including Tennessee, and grafted along just, along just that state. Comparatively, Tennessee developed at a slightly slower rate than the South as a whole while reaching initial peak in the decade preceding 1865. In this respect, uh, in this later respect, it falls much like the entire region. By visualizing the data, trends become clear, allowing us to ask further and more pointed questions. It's, it's easy to make a fetish of numbers and graphs, so my approach has been necessarily a conservative one. Like many people in the crowd, I have a skeptical view uh, of, of radical claims for work like this. Uh, 
it necessarily stems from what I, what I am already doing, which is close looking at art and then developing questions from there. Uh, my talk here is about a tool rather than a painting, so it seems best to explore that tool and to see, what ends, see to what ends it can be pushed. So I've, I've got a simple question, and, and feel free to, to shout an, out an answer. All right? Uh, what city did American artists paint most frequently? What's that? Here in DC? <laughs> Philadelphia? All right, well, the answer is New York, uh, and, and by a long shot. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, after that, though, uh, do we think it's D.C. or Philadelphia or Boston? Philadelphia? Well, uh, actually, it's, it's Venice, Italy. <laughs> uh, and then Paris. Uh, at, at which point we reach Boston and then San Francisco, actually. Um, and then farther down the line, in about 7th or 8th, we've, we finally re reach Washington, D.C. <laughs> Uh, perhaps some of those results surprise you, which is the goal of the research, to make you pause and say, huh, that's odd. Uh, through different research methods, other conclusions might have been reached, but the facts, the, the data speak otherwise, driving further questions. Why was Venice the second most painted city in, in American art? And, and why San Francisco so far up? Perhaps more importantly, why were these results surprises? Do they reflect emphases in 19th century publications, lacunae in contemporary scholarship, or something else entirely? The question of center and periphery in American art is a difficult one, and raw, da and raw data alone won't answer it. But the information, looking beyond masterpieces and known artists and selective sources, speaks directly to concrete problems. Where I've looked at cities, similar data exists in the database for mountains, lakes, parks, rivers, valley, valleys, and even specific waterfalls. Examining the data across time leads to further questions. Why, for example, did the growth of Boston's artistic community largely stagnate after 1840, while New York's continued to expand? Given that the inventory is not comprehensive after 1914, uh, that's why I stop the analysis at that date. Uh, but we can still chart but we can chart the still explosive growth up until that point, noting, noting a, a sharp uptick in the final decade in New York City. What drove these changes, and were they visible to artists and critics on the ground? Similarly, we can look at European cities and ask related questions. Uh, these problems, of course, are not new concerns. Rather, the data here allows us to ask more specific and more pointed questions to surprise and to confront ourselves with the schematic view of the landscape. It is not an end, but a new entry point based on empirical data presented visually. The method seems especially well suited to the demands of 19th century American art, American landscape. Boosters, patrons, and artists of the era frequently conceived of urban development in similar terms. Take, for example, this cover of an 1887 Chicago guidebook. It presents a cartoon chariot race called here the great contest for supremacy. The backdrop for the race is a symbol of the long-lasting artistic and architectural heritage of Rome, a structure remini reminiscent of the Colosseum, referred to, referred to here as the world's amphitheater. Chicago, on a chariot marked progress, pushes into the lead. And behind it, to either side, Cincinnati and St. Louis drive on. Artistic tradition, economic progress, and the roles within a viable city are, are casually intermingled, and even in the simple guidebook cover. And so, we, so we can look at uh, you know, this data and, and examine it as they couldn't on the ground, uh, but with you know, hindsight and with a fairly extensive database, we can, we can draw conclusions from that. Uh, 19th century observers saw similar contests between Philadelphia and Baltimore, as well as cities of the urban south like Atlanta, Dallas, and Chattanooga. Today, scholars and urban planners are more likely to see the livelihood of cities as, as linked, more, in, more interconnected, than as the boosters of the 19th century did, as a 
and zero-sum opposite, opposites chasing scarce resources. To be sure, I, I actually consider that a limitation of, of, this pro, of this project as I've done it, uh, which is that you know, these works have difficulty conveying the fluidity and movement of the era's artists. You know, a, a railroad in Chattanooga necessarily leads somewhere to Atlanta or to Nashville, even on to Chicago. Uh, and furthermore, an art academy in Cincinnati benefits the whole Midwest. A graph might capture some of this diffusion, but quite clearly not all of it. Future research, and, and you know, I, mu I must maintain that this is a work in progress, future research might hope to find a way to signify or represent the fluidity of this movement. You can also look at something like you know, the parks uh, with you know, Catskills in blue, the Adirondacks in red, and Central Park in green, uh, where you know, the two mountains peaked quite early around 1870, and with the, the growth of sort of naturalistic technique and American Impressionism, uh, Central Park uh, grew steadily over the course of the, of the 19th century. Uh, in some ways, you know, this, this reflects the, the strength of a local art, artistic community but also transportation infrastructure and market demands. Now, the, uh, the conveners of this conference have asked speakers uh, to discuss their backgrounds, their training, and, and their partnerships. Uh, as for me, you know, currently I'm a, I'm a graduate student in the history of art at Williams College. Uh, like most of you, I assume, I, I specialize in 19th century American art and focus on how artists imagine and figure their communities. Uh, my research here sprang organically from those interests in, in hoping to find new tools to address existing questions. Uh, previously in college, I, I had studied biology and history and did research for several years in a cancer epigenetics lab. Uh, my approach to historical problems uh, has been influenced by this study in natural science, forming hypotheses based on close observation and then evaluating based on a wide data set. That said, the approach here is different from that of, of lab science for a whole host of reasons. And we were also asked to discuss our, our partnerships. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't have a, a full team, quite clearly. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm the only statistician around. <laughs> uh, but, you know, and in, dis in discussing those partnerships, uh, I'll, I'll come to a, a constraint that was at play in, in this study, uh, which, which speaks to the type of analysis uh, that's, that's possible with data like this, uh, but also to how databases in art history are, are used more generally. Uh, the inventory of American paintings is maintained by the Smithsonian American Art Museum, which we're in, uh, and the inventory is available through a, a web form, uh, which was not intended for larger scale analysis of the sort uh, that, was, that was produced here. Uh, I, I was unable to locate any other study that addressed the data set as a whole, rather than as a source for, for individual entries. It's common in, ec in economics or biology for data sets to be available in an open, downloadable, and machine-readable format. For, for privacy considerations, however, the inventory data is accessible only through, through this web form. In order to build a database with this level of comprehensiveness, 300,000 plus entries. Some of the ownership information had to be restricted. Contributing collectors and institutions had reservations about how their information would be used, as some of it is confidential. For example, the names and addresses of private owners of major works. They agreed to provide information with the understanding that it would be used only for research and educational purposes, without any commercial applications. Now, on that end, the staff of the inventory, with whom I've corresponded, uh, was exceptionally helpful, kind, uh, and answered any, any question I had. Uh, which brings me to my other collaboration. In, in continuing to, to respect the privacy restrictions in place and using only the publicly available data, uh, a, a graduate student in the Department of Mathematics at MIT, William Yu, uh, helped me to program a script to download and process all of those entries in bulk, you know, since they're only available on, on a web form. Uh, his work allowed me to create a, a database that more or less mirrors the landscape information in that, inv in that inventories, uh, making you know, all, the, all this analysis possible. And in this way, 
the, the project remains a work in progress. So thank you.